Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with his expert uh, Thursday mornings. I almost forgot what day it was. Jonathan Tuomly, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you today? I'm great, man. Every day Saturday for me, but uh, I know what day it is, but who I'm talking to. And I'm like, who am I speaking <laughs> with? It's got to be Thursday. <laughs> if it's Jonathan, it's Thursday. It's, that's all I know. It's, it's, yeah. Like, if we had to reschedule a Friday, I'd be all blown up. I'd be all confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, one of the things I knew I wanted to talk to you about this week is I increasingly believe your call I think it was six weeks ago. It might have been eight. It's like, Michael, you need to, you need to think about ch- China and what's going on there, almost like Japan's lost decade. And I didn't get it in the beginning. I didn't get it. It was so, it was just, it was left field for me at the time. But the more and more I research, I think you are right. Uh, China is in for a world of pain. But what I wanted to ask you is, is anytime there's pain, there's also opportunity. So, you know, if we can sort of talk about what Japan went through uh, you know, both sort of their struggle, but also where was the opportunity to make money around it? Um, so, yeah, well, that's an interesting question because I hadn't really thought so much about where the opportunity is, but let's so, sort of talk about what it looks like. And then maybe okay. we can think about how you, how, how you make money on this, but you know, Perfect. in, so in Japan, what ha- they had, I mean, it's a little bit different because they had, I mean, they had, you know, 45 years of consistent economic growth that was only interrupted by a couple of things like, the OPEC shocks and, you know, they still call it the Nixon shock and in Japan where when Nixon went off the gold standard okay. and stuff like that. So there were some shocks, but they were short lived, quick recovery. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but then things really just sort of ground to all then. Uh, well, so the big thing that happened was the Plaza Accord in 1985 or 86, when basically like the U S and every other country just basically beat Japan over the head and forced them to revalue their currency, mm-hmm. right? Because it had been something like 300 yen to the dollar. And, you know, of course, lazy ass, like rather than being like, hey, why don't we just make better stuff? You know, they're like, oh, Japan is out competing us because they're, the yen is cheap, right? Yeah, and, okay, sure, yeah. Which you hear a lot with respect to China too. Like, sure. oh, they're, they're, they're manipulating their currency rather than like, whatever. But in the, in the you know, like, so here we were like producing these crappy K cars and stuff. Yeah. And one, I mean, and one, look at the one, cars in the eighties folks. They were not good in the U S yeah. And wondering why the Japanese didn't want to buy any of them when they had like five of the top auto manufacturers in the world and they were eating our lunch. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, because their cars were just so much better. Right. Yeah. So, and then, oh, it's because the end yeah, is cheap anyway. So the, the, the Western economies literally like twisted Japan's arm and forced them to revalue their currency okay. from like three, 300 yen to the dollar to something like 150 or something. And it was a huge jump. Huge right? so, okay. yep. so suddenly, basically what happened is now Japan found itself twice as rich mm. like around the world, right? Okay. So that's why they started buying all these assets everywhere, right? Because ah, suddenly, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So suddenly had literally overnight, they, they doubled their wealth, right? And so it fueled this, what was already a booming economy in real estate and stocks, just like like the whole thing just went. Yeah, they were they were in party mode. I mean, it went vertical. The stock market oh. literally went went vertical, right? So okay. huge bubble. And then that, when it petered out and part of it was demographic, like the flip over of the baby boomers, like in Japan, who like sure. literally like topped up, topped off around in the late eighties. Mm-hmm. And there were I, some other, I can't remember exactly what the other, uh, sort of shocks were, but basically what happened was the bubble burst, right? And real estate over the course of the next couple of years lost 90% of its value in Japan. This is in Japan. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I want to play that out. So, okay, they're, they're going in, they revalue your currency, it's up. The people that had money have more money. Uh, they go on very quick and aggressive buying binges, both internally yeah. and externally. Yeah. Then, okay, then the economy turns and then, so- how did that, I mean, 90% drop is horrific. Yeah. I, I don't know the lending market in Japan at all. Uh, is it, do they do loans? Do they have to pay cash or? Well, so, I mean, so here's what, from my recollection of this time period, what, what people were talking about. They were talking about stuff like, well, for J- the average Japanese person to buy a house, they needed a 100 year mortgage, right? Oh, Jesus. So, yeah. okay. and they were, and they were buying houses like two hours away from Tokyo. Right. Mm. And with a hundred year mortgages and, you know, 
So some, it was just insane because the prices just got bid up so high. And I don't know if you remember this, but like, do you remember them talking about like, you know, the land under the Imperial Palace in Tokyo being worth more than the entire state of California? I remember that. Yeah, right? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's just insane if you think about it. like, and of course, you know, this is how bubble psychology works. Nobody thought that was messed up. They were, <laughs> yeah. nope, it right, made right? sense to everyone. Yeah. Right. Everyone was like, wow, the land is really expensive in Japan. It's just how it is. Yeah. Right. Nobody was thinking like this makes zero sense at all. Okay. Right. Yeah. The population of Japan is I mean, the, the whole landmass of Japan is about the same size as California. But that little spot yeah. is worth more than all the land in California. Yeah, right. Crazy, I mean, yeah. just made no sense. But people in bubble psychology, they're like it's and it's going to go higher. Right. That's, yeah, the, the herd's right. dangerous. Yes. It's going to go higher. So buy now. And so anyway, crash happened. Stock market tanked, lost like two thirds of its value or something like that over time, real estate, it didn't yeah. obviously collapse right away, but no, it's sticky on the way down. People, it's sticky. Yeah. People stop buying. Right. That's and what's going on in China right now. I look forward to the yeah. October numbers. They're going to be ba bad. Banks stopped lending. Right. Because yeah. it's no one wants to catch a falling knife. Right. And so over the next, you know, decade or so yeah. land values just crept down and down so and down. But but so just uh, to answer okay. a question, I know you're going to ask me. Mm -hmm. So what, what was going on with the banks? Well, a lot of the lending, especially on the commercial side in Japan was between, and I think there might be similar relationships in, in, um, in China, but essentially like captive banks were lending to related companies, right? Yeah. So, so they didn't for, they didn't foreclose because it's like, well, we're not going to put our sister company out of business. Yeah, it was the classic so, extend and pretend. So they just kept on, you know, kicking the can down the road, kicking the can down the road, mm -hmm. right? And and eventually, over thirty years time, I mean, a lot of this debt yeah. did get cleaned up, but it took a very long time, and it was a huge drag on the economy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and people weren't there wasn't like a foreclosure crisis in Japan yeah. because people were they had these hundred year mortgages and they could continue to service them. Yeah. They could service them. Yeah. Yeah. And Japan is a country where it's like, it, it would be very embarrassing to like default on your loan. And so, I mean, it's like, people just don't do stuff. They just keep on paying. It's not like here. We're like, ah, yeah. walk away, oh, well, right? you know, seven years. I'll be good. Yeah. And also like, where were people going to go? Right. They yeah. weren't like, there, there was no place for them to go. So they just kept on servicing those loans. Okay. Right. And, and so they, there wasn't like a banking crisis in in japan but just the whole just the air went out of the economy yeah. and um it, it just and it really the culture of japan changed okay. within a couple of years and literally was, there was that was the time that i was living there like so oh, wow. right after i went there right after the bubble collapse and lived there for like the early 90s so i kind of saw this this process in action how sort of people's perceptions changed, changed in japan yeah well Again, I'm trying to equate what's going on or what happened with Japan, your experience with China. What Again, I was not, obviously never lived there. Um, I just, re I remember them buying a lot of trophy assets, right? I remember yeah. Pebble Beach being the one that I remember, right? Because right. it's relatively close to me. Yeah, Rockefeller Center. Right, right. Rockefeller bought, Center, yeah, right? And one. then they sold them at huge losses, right? Yeah. Um, when I think about what I've seen the Chinese do is, uh, first off, the kind of central government, they have been buying um commodities around the world right they've been they've been doing that i don't remember them and maybe they have via you know shell companies i don't remember them buying trophy assets i remember a, i know a lot of chinese citizens have bought homes in like southern california right it's, it's it's almost comical how many of those houses are up you know empty or maybe they're full with one student um well, i just wonder what it happens. wasn't yeah i mean listen so china's advantage is that it saw what the japanese did so they knew not to repeat some of the mistakes. But, oh, that's true, but, right? Okay. But what, but what is similar and, and perhaps worse was that all of this was like debt fuel, right? And you've yeah. got the same. So in Japan, you had bad incentives where you had banks essentially lending to related companies. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of, there wasn't the same level of scrutiny, right? right. And, probably, and probably there was also internal pressure to lend. Yeah, I'm sure right? there was, yeah. Right, and whereas in China, it's, you know, basically the Chinese government has been forcing banks to lend, right? And 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 so the, the danger now with, with with China though is that you know 
what is it like one third of GDP is from construction? Yeah, it's, if, if you if you put all of the property together, yeah, it's twenty eight to thirty three percent, depending on how you listen to is 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 property related. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to go back and see if there's a way to find out what the similar, you know, what the comparable statistic for Japan was in nineteen eighty nine. Well, right. the, the biggest but, problem for me, actually, Jonathan, is at the consumer level is 80 percent of the, in, the Chinese consumers wealth is, is in housing. Yeah. And the worst part is the housing's not income producing. They leave right. them empty. Yeah, this is this is nuts. And I don't know if you saw this. I put out an email the other day on how cryptocurrency is exactly yeah, the same Chinese that. real estate. Yeah, it's I, pretty true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you if you if you think it's different, I mean, like you got to think about this hard, but, uh, you know. But yeah, so so in some ways, China is setting itself up for an even worse situation because in Japan, you didn't have that idea of like, well, we're just going to buy real estate because like real estate somehow is magical and that it's, is it's a, it's a, magic is the right word. Yeah. They just believed, and that's why the the middle class they own one point five homes on average, which yeah. means several people own three or four, and they're empty. Yeah, they're. See, it's in just mind boggling. In Japan, they didn't have that because, well, frankly, like, I mean, I think people, China has a huge population, but China is also a huge country. Oh, right? yeah. and, when we're, and when we were talking before about, in, in one of the previous episodes, I say about, about land, about development and, and like the process of people moving to the suburbs because there's open farmland. Like, China had a lot of open land that you could develop. Oh, yeah. They're huge. And so, yeah. and so was, you didn't have that in Japan. Like, Japan basically is like, it's a mountainous country. You can literally build on all, all of the buildable land and all the farmland together is 10% of the Japanese landmass. The rest oh, is wow. mountain, the rest is mountains. You can't, it's hard to build on. You can't farm it. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so there's very little land to go around wow. on like China. So you didn't have that phenomenon of like these ghost things being built. I mean, you did have some people buying like second homes, but they were vacation homes. They weren't, yeah. like, they weren't just like, I'm going to buy this condo in this empty town because well it's going to hold its value because it's because it's gone up for 40 years in a row that's not that's, 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 it's going to hold its value because it's going to hold its value right yeah. to, totally circular yeah there, you didn't have that in japan wow right okay so but you still had you know this phenomenon of real estate being bid up because everybody felt like this was that it was going to keep on rising in value and rising in value and rising in value right so there's similarity there but i don't think it was ever for average people, the same extent of like yeah. exposure to the real estate market that people have in China. Plus, you don't have this phenomenon of it all being empty, right? Yeah, it's so empty. I can't purely speculative, it. right? So, uh, so I think that th looking at the J the Japanese example, like Chinese government got some things right, and they didn't go on this spending spree around the world, mm -hmm. like they. But yeah, they weren't buying they, trophies, yeah. but they did it internally, right? And they did it to profit. Well, their up. people did, yeah. Yeah, well, then, but the government too, and the government encouraged all this development to happen, right? Because it, it created jobs, you know, yeah. it, it, and, you know, so you have, you have um, that huge exposure. If you want to ask me then sort of what Japan looked like after that, well, there was a huge destruction of wealth, right? A huge overhang of debt. And this, this really impacted economic growth for a very long time. So when you talk about the lost decade, you didn't see... A situation in Japan where uh, it didn't even look like what the U.S. looked like after the Great Financial Crisis, where millions were thrown out of work. Like if you, you just didn't have that situation in Japan because of the structure of the economy, right? Mm -hmm. There, what unemployment didn't really rise that much, right? But um, and I think probably it, it helped that the population was topping out, so right. it didn't have that problem. Whereas for us in 2006, our population was still growing pretty strongly, right? Mm -hmm. So. But you didn't have that that issue, but you just wound up with this long period of time where, you know, Japan was always basically kind of like somewhere between you know a half a point of growth and a half a point of contraction, like sort of all the time, just bumping yeah. around. I don't know if you if you remember Mario Mendoza, the, mm -hmm. the ball player. Yeah, the Mendoza about the line. Mendoza line, because the guy every year the guy hit between one ninety eight and two hundred one every single year, right? And yeah. so Japan was at the Mendoza line of like zero growth. For, for a very, very long time because it had this huge debt overhang. Yeah. On and, the other hand, like yeah. you didn't, you, if you walk through a Japanese city, at least the major cities, you did not see, uh, you know, empty storefronts. 
You did right. not see empty restaurants. Because like, they just eked out, right? They just kept right. moving. Where, where it was happening was in the small towns around Japan that were becoming depopulated mm -hmm. and, you know, where all the young people had moved away. And now you've, you know, those people literally, now you have a situation where, you know, the governments are giving away houses and giving away land because nobody wants it, right? Yeah. And the, the children don't want it because they live in Tokyo. And like, what are they going to do with this house yeah. in, in some small town? And, that, and they can't, you can't rent them out because nobody, there's not tourist areas, right? Nobody's going to go there for any reason. So mm. there's a lot of just empty houses that are just literally deteriorating. So you could see the same, I mean, what's good? I, I, like I think these ghost cities in in China are going to become like ghost ruined cities because I agree. There's, and and that means the wealth that those people thought they had goes poof. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you've got the population, the, the similar thing to China and Japan right now. So the two things is all this was debt fueled and this huge overhang of debt, right? And and the and the demographic sort of bomb. That's, yeah, they've, they've that's, self in, they've self inflicted. Yeah, that is going to hit China, uh, and it's already starting to hit China. Where there's just not literally the people needed to continue the they, bubble. They're not there. They're not, they don't exist. They don't physically yeah. exist. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's going to be. A, so I think, you know, it's going to be somewhere between stagnation and like implosion in yeah. China. And I think the reason I think the risk is somewhat higher there. Is because like in, in the case of, of Japan, like well, the, the companies that overpaid for these apps, you know, it was companies yeah. with like tons and tons of and they took huge hits, yeah, but it didn't threaten the existence of the companies. No, like, the company was, was fine. It was, was just it like, was embarrassing. Yeah, it was all like extra cash that they had and they needed to do something with it. So it wasn't like fundamental to their business. They weren't going out of business because they lost money on these deals. Mm. In China, however, like you said, the average person is exposed to this huge yeah it's not useless, useless inventory of real estate and like yeah, when th that's where i'm at there, the consumer yeah. psychology is something i've been following mainly in the us but I, I having traveled the world for my job and done a million miles or almost a million miles people are people and right now if you're in china just like in the us if you are suddenly worth 50% less you are going to consume less you're going to save more you're you're going to be less risky then you're going to tell your kids, oh, real estate sucks. Don't buy it. It crushed me. It's going to be mm -hmm. generations. It's, yeah. it's, oh, it's going to be painful. Yeah. And they can't, and the, and the government can't pump up the real estate market because it already did. Like it's broke. No, it once did. you break consumer psychology, they yeah. stop buying. You can't but, put a gun to someone's head and say, buy a home. Right. But I mean, but this is like where we are now is the result, is the, the result of the pump up. Right? Oh, no so question. You so you can't pump it up anymore. Yeah. The, the, right? Once, yeah. Once a bubble yeah. is, popped you can't recreate that bubble it's, yeah so so the, the whole like if people now get the idea that well they don't if they start worrying about the catching a falling knife problem and they don't want to buy and they just stop buying the stuff that means that all these people who you know there if you think about this there's there's no public pension system nope. in china right there's they, i don't know if they have 401ks or not but no, basically what if. most people's retirement plan is i'm going to buy this real estate yes and then when i need the money i'm going to sell I'm it sell it and if they can't sell it what, what are they going to live on? Right. And oh, then what, and then what is that? What, how does that, what's the impact on the society? Right. The, what, how does that destabilize things? If you have suddenly literally, you know, millions, tens of millions of people who now. And cannot, some of these are going to be worth zero. Yeah. Zero. No. Yeah. Oh, not that's, good. That's the recipe for, for a lot of social unrest. So, um, you know, keep your eyes peeled. How you profit on this? Well, I mean, I don't know what, I, what I saw in Japan was, the proliferation of all you can eat restaurants during the recession, like yeah. suddenly everywhere you went was like, you know, 20 bucks, all you can eat, you mm -hmm. know, and th they were everywhere. The wow. cheap stuff got to be, you know, dollar shops got to be very popular. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I don't know how you, how you invest on that from here, right. but uh, you know, I don't know. Do you have any ideas of how you invest? On well, the that? only, this, again, the only short, thing short, I could... short the stock, short Chinese yeah. stocks, short the, short the Chinese stock market. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I think about is again, I, I, we, Olivia and I went down to Southern California. We have lots of friends and family down there, and lots of times because we're in real estate, we go to open houses, and mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times we went to open houses that there was a Chinese student going to UCLA or USC or wherever yeah. they were going. I just wonder what do those people do, right? Because again, they got the, they got their money out already, so that's cool. Yeah. 
but it is there's two things I think about. One is could the Chinese government set a rule that says, you know, you have a year to bring that money home? They could. Two, maybe this is the only way people can save their money. So there's the opposite effect. I'm not right. going to buy anything in China. I'm going to buy more in the United States. Yeah, that could be. So these are all things I'm thinking about. And I don't have an answer yet. So that's that's where my mind goes. Yeah, well, I don't think that the Chinese government is going to have any ability to say bring the money home because most of these people have bought. I mean, there were already currency controls. People weren't allowed to buy stuff here. Yeah, well, people one of the loopholes is you could buy a home for your, your kid to go to school. Oh, really? That was? That was, that was yeah. a known loophole, right? Yeah. But I, I know that people, you know, so because back when I first got into real estate, I was kind of involved with some Chinese investors and people were literally bringing suitcases full of cash literally to yes. the U S because they could not, there was no legal way for them to transfer money to the U S by, by like wire. Cause it was, so they had to sneak it out of the country and, yeah. uh, and they were willing to do it because, uh, you know, they, they wanted to get that money out. So, and, and, and the government tried its best to crack down on it, but it had very little ability to do so, but, you know, so the, I'm not sure how they could make people repatriate that money. But I, I, on the other hand, I do think that you could see, more flight capital coming out of China. So I think you'll, you might see the currency controls getting even stricter mm -hmm. in, in China to, to prevent it. Because I mean, the last thing you want as an economy is having- Yeah, your capital your going- Capital start fleeing. Yeah, yeah that's that'll not just good. accelerate, accelerate the, the, the collapse of the bubble. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this has been a lot of fun, Jonathan. I got to get going to my next call. You have a wonderful day, okay? You too. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, bud.